All right, well, turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. I'll read the text there in a moment. So if you're 35 years or older, you probably remember the terrorist attack upon our country on September 11th, 2001. I remember the day well. I remember all the details, the uh, anxious thoughts that you hear in the family and in the community. You probably remember those images of the Twin Towers and the billowing black smoke when those airplanes were hijacked and turned into bombs and those terrorists uh, went on a kamikaze mission against our country. These evil men infiltrated the airlines and uh, brought damage and fear and turmoil to our country. When you think about the deaths the collapsed buildings, the calamity, and you realize just what an intense form of the attack it was. Well, this is true spiritually as well. If you can imagine on a smaller scale, instead of uh, the Twin Towers on fire, think about our little church here. And what would happen in a spiritual way if we were hijacked and uh, evil men came in and shattered our fellowship? How would you feel If all of a sudden your pastor or one of the elders went off the rails or somehow the fellowship was shattered by some kind of division, it's terrifying. It's um, saddening. And I tell you this story because I feel like the message in the book of Jude exhorts us to think about it this way and realize that the truth must be defended. We must earnestly contend for the faith that's been delivered to us because there are evil men in the world and they seek to bring harm to God's people and their fellowship with him. So the sermon today will be taken from the first four verses uh, in the epistle of Jude. This will be a short sermon series. Lord willing, it'll be this sermon plus two more. I feel like it'll be encouraging for you. But today, the first four verses I've got divided into three headings. Number one, the author. Number two, the audience. And number three, the admonition. So read along with me the first four verses of the epistle of Jude. It says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So, I think we'll have a great and profitable time studying this passage together. The first point in the sermon is, let's look at the author. Who's writing and what can we learn from this? And we get this just from the first line in verse 1. It begins with the name Jude. And this is the man who penned this epistle. And he tells us next that he's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And then he tells us that he's the brother of James. Now, it's interesting, Jude is a common name in Bible times. It's the English form of what we would call uh, Judas. And also, Judas is taken from the Hebrew form for Judah. So if you can imagine how common Judah would have been, he's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So Judah would have been a common name. And then when you translate that into Greek, it renders Judas. And there's multiple Judases in the New Testament. And this particular one is associated with James. He said he's the brother of James. Now, one, James is an apostle. And we can be pretty sure that this is not the Jude that's, I'm sorry, one Jude was an apostle. And I don't think uh, Jude would, that the apostle was writing this letter. Because I think he would have identified himself as an apostle. It would have been important to say, I'm an apostle and I'm writing to you with this authority. That's how many other New Testament letters were written. Instead, Jude says, no, I'm brother to James. And when we go back to Matthew chapter 13 and read 
um, about Jesus' family, Matthew 13 and verse 55, it says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? And is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas, or Jude? So very likely, and almost certainly, the one who authored our epistle is Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. It's also very likely that these four siblings, mentioned here in verse 55 of Matthew 13, is age order. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. So if that's true, our author for this epistle is Jesus' little brother. And the older brother would have been James, who was the uh, very prominent figure and leader in the church in the book of Acts. And so Jude is writing to associate himself with that James, that James who would have been well known. He's not Jude the apostle, he's Jude the brother of James, which makes him the brother of Jesus as well. But notice what Jude says about himself. He says, I'm bondservant or slave of Jesus Christ. He's not calling Jesus his sibling. He's calling him his master. This is a remarkable statement of humility. He's saying, oh, Jesus is my brother, but I'm not writing about him as my brother. I'm writing to you as he's my master and I'm his slave. And this is important because as Jude will go throughout this letter to talk about the false teachers and how they want to infiltrate the church, he's going to point out their arrogance and he's going to point out their pride. And Jude here presents himself as a man with genuine humility. He doesn't say, hey, I actually grew up with the champion of our faith. He doesn't say, I have some inside connections. He doesn't say, hey, I can tell you some really cool stories about when we were kids. No. He says, I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He mentions nothing of his family connection. Also, we learn from church history, Clement of Alexandria and Eusebius, both of these testify to the fact that Jude was the half-brother. Jesus. So I think that's special for us. And right out the gate, we get a lesson in humility. And we want to follow men like Jude and not be arrogant, be so heady and high-minded to think that we should be promoted, but have the heartfelt humility of a man like Jude. So that's the author. Point two of the sermon. Let's move on and talk about the audience. Still in verse one, who is Jude talking to? It says, to those who are the called. Now, first of all, it's interesting to note that Jude is not addressing a church. Many times when Paul would write letters, he would write to a church or write to churches in a certain region, not Jude. He seems to be writing specifically to individuals. I'm sure these individuals were a part of a church, maybe a collection of churches or fellowships, but he's just writing simply to individuals. And he calls them first the called. That's interesting. As we hear Jude call believers or Christians the called, we get a little window into Jude's theology because other parts of Scripture call Christians this way. I think specifically of Romans chapter 8 and verse 30, it says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So the Bible is willing to talk about believers as the called ones, the ones who are called. God effectually calls them. The gospel call goes out, calls every man to repent. But there is that aspect in which God's grace effectually works in his people to draw them to saving faith. Parallel passage I would read for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says this, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So yes, as Jude writes to believers, he says, the called ones, the ones whom God has drawn from darkness to light and regenerated, that's who he's writing to. He's writing to believers. Then moving on, Jude says, calls them beloved in God the Father. 
If you were here last week when I preached the sermon about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, and we talked about God's love for the sinful mass of humanity and how that's expressed. And here, believers enjoy that love from their Father. He calls them beloved in God the Father. And then he relates them to their master, Jesus Christ. He says they're kept. Again, this beautiful theological picture that the people Jude is writing to are the ones that God loves, the ones that it's been called, and the ones that are being kept for Jesus Christ. Again, those passages in John that speak of God's people being his sheep, and they're in the hand of the Father, and they're in the hand of Christ and no one can snatch them out of that hand. They're kept for Jesus Christ. And this whole idea of being kept will surface again in Jude. I point out to you verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. What a comfort to know that if you're God's, to know if you're saved, If you're beloved in God the Father, you're being kept for Jesus Christ. Be encouraged today, O Christian. You're being kept. You're on heaven's list. You belong to him, and no one can snatch you out of his hand. You're kept for Jesus Christ. These are the people Jude is writing to. Then one last line in verse 2, he says, May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Now, if you were paying attention in the text earlier, when I read it, we're going to see that Jude says, you people need an exhortation. You people need an admonition because they're under the danger of false teachers. And I find special encouragement when Jude says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you, multiplied to people who are under the threat of false teaching. And that's encouraging to me because even people who are under the need of exhortation and are suffering from the threat of false teaching can still have mercy, peace, and love multiplied to them. And that's because our peace passes understanding and the love comes from God and our joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So are you harassed today, O Christian, by false doctrine like the people Jude was writing to? Or are you under the heavy hand of some other trial in your life? May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. If it can be multiplied to the believers that Jude was writing to who need an admonition against false teaching, then no doubt... It can be multiplied to you today. And notice it didn't say just meagerly measured to you. It didn't say dropped along here and there, multiplied. This is because of the indwelling spirit of God that aids God's people, that supplies them, that strengthens them to walk with him, that fills them with joy. Yes, I'm reminded of that scene in Pilgrim's Progress where Bunyan tells about this fire that's burning beside a wall. And this man is here hurling water on the fire, but the fire keeps burning brighter and brighter. And the secret to it is through the wall is a pipe. And on the other side of the wall, a man is pouring oil in the pipe and the oil is feeding the fire. And the lesson in this is, this fire is the love of God burning in our hearts. The man throwing the water is Satan and the trials of life, but it cannot be put out because the Holy Spirit fuels the fire with his own power and with his own joy. So here are the believers that Jude is writing to, chaffing under the false teachers, but Jude writes, may mercy Peace and love be multiplied to you. Well, we've seen the author. We've seen the audience. Now let's move on and consider the admonition. 
This will be found in verses 3 and 4. Notice right off in verse 3, Jude's pastoral flavor. He doesn't yank them around in harshness. He says, beloved. Beloved. God loves his own people. Jude loves them as well, and he calls them beloved. And then he says, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I find this phrase fascinating. Somewhere in Jude's computer, he had a rough draft to these believers about salvation. And oh my, I wish there could somehow be footnotes on the inspired pages of Scripture where Jude could put his rough draft down in the footnotes because I would love to read it. Oh well, maybe I'll ask him about it in heaven one day. But he had ideas. He had theology. He says, look, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. And oh, I bet Jude had some things to say, being the half-brother of Jesus. And we know from other scripture that many of Jesus' siblings did not believe towards the end. And Jude probably could have written about the hardness of his heart and how he thought Jesus was crazy until later on. Oh, I would have loved to heard Jude's salvation letter. He talked about this common salvation. Not common in the sense that uh, it's every day. It's common in the sense that it's mutual with all who are saved. It's mutual between Jude and the people he's writing to. So this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to just sit down and let my pen go to work. I wanted to let my heart overflow about the joys of Christ and the gospel and the good news. But, he says, I felt the necessity to write to you, to appeal or plead or urge or exhort that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. You know, this speaks several things to me. First of all, it tells me that these people knew the salvation. Otherwise, that would have been more needful. These people knew the gospel. They were believers. They were the called. They were beloved of God the Father. They were being kept for Jesus Christ. So they knew the salvation message. And Jude said, you need to hear something else. You need to be exhorted that you contend earnestly for the faith. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about this contending earnestly. This is the title of the sermon. It's interesting that in Greek, it's all one word. It's contend earnestly. And it's fascinating that the root word for this single word is where we get agony. In fact, again, the root word is used for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he agonized. So it conveys the idea of struggle, agony. And when a a, a Greek preposition is coupled with this word, it means contend, it means struggle, it means fight, it's intense. You read a couple passages that sort of support this idea in Scripture. 1 Timothy 1.18, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previous made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. Yeah, Fight the good fight, Paul tells Timothy. And in chapter 6, verse 12, a similar phrase, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Yes, the same idea. Contend for the faith, says Jude. Fight for it, defend it, hold to it. Okay, so Jude's instructed the believers to contend earnestly, to struggle, to hang on to the faith. But what does he mean for the faith? Is this like faith in the sense in which we believe when we're justified, when we're brought into salvation? No, Jude used this word faith here to describe the whole body of truth. This idea that no, the gospel, the good news what we learned from others, that faith that you hold to, meaning that content of truth, that you defend that. And again, I want to read some other passages for you that will support this, because when you think about it, the disciples, 
who later on became apostles. These were the men who were responsible for passing this on. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So the book of Acts is the story of what Jesus Christ did through his apostles as the good news began to spread. So this idea is that there was a message that Jesus gave, that the apostles understood, and that they witnessed and spread that. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, now, now, here's Paul writing. Now, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, to which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. You hear how Paul's saying, look, I gave you something. You stand in what I gave you. You were saved, if you hold fast. And he says, look, I gave you what was first important from the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Paul had this awareness of who Jesus was, and he shared it with others. That's the faith that you defend, Jude says. Similar passage in 2 Thessalonians. Listen as I read that to you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. says this, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Look, you receive something from us. Depart from brothers who act contrary to that. So this faith that Jude is saying they must defend is a very clear body of truth that the early church and early believers hung on to. It was an awareness of who Jesus was and how he fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures and how he was the son of God and how he was the fulfillment of their Messiah. And that was what they witnessed to in the book of Acts. And that's what they were martyred for. And Jude is saying, contend earnestly for that faith. This is even impacted more by the phrase, the once for all handed down to the saints. In fact, how that's constructed in the original could be like, okay, what kind of faith is this? The kind of faith that's the once and for all delivered to the saints type. That kind of faith. So yes, this this tells us that even this early church had the awareness that what we're getting is something to be passed on. This is something to hang on to. It speaks of the finality of the message that happened around Jesus and the apostles. Remember, Jude was not an apostle. And he said, defend this faith, the kind that was once for all, finally given to us, that faith. So the admonition is believers contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. I may touch on this a bit later, but let me just pause and allow this to get personal for us. Jude did not say, be contentious. There is a difference between being contentious and contending. Contentious people are a thorn in your side. If you want to go left, they want to go right. If you want to go up, they want to go down. If you want blue, they want red. Contentious people are always out for drama and trouble. Jude is not saying, be contentious. He's saying, contend. Scripture calls us to speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. So I am not exhorting you this morning to be a contentious person. But I am saying that there is a faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. And we should know what that faith is, and we should be ready to defend it. And I am saying that truth matters. And the gospel is not relative. And we can't culturize the message of the Bible. And here at Southside, we want to be, as it says in the New Testament, a pillar and a buttress for the truth. Truth 
does matter. If the church doesn't tell the world what's true, who will? Yes, we should earnestly contend for the faith. But why should we do this? Look with me at verse 4. It says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, just like those slimy terrorists that weaseled their way into those planes and turned them into bombs with innocent civilians on board. People, slither into fellowships, slither into your life with bad doctrine, with bad practices, with bad literature, it becomes a threat to your fellowship with God. It says certain persons have crept in unnoticed. You know, false teachers don't wear name tags, don't you? They don't walk into churches and say, hi, I'm a false teacher. I'm here to spread some of my ideas. Do you have any openings in your classes? They don't say that. They creep in unnoticed. On your YouTube feed, the false teacher headlines may have the same headline as another video that's biblical truth. There's not a filter you can put on that will remove your need for discernment. No. Certain persons creep in unnoticed, unawares. They slither in. They slide in where they don't belong. This is where Jude gets a little fiery. He says, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. I think what he's saying here is referring to Old Testament scriptures that speak about the false prophets and the judgment that they will receive. And a bit later in the letter, Lord willing, next Lord's Day, we'll see that passage where Jude begins to reach back in the Old Testament and bring forward these examples that say, look, this is not the first time there's been apostates. It's not the first time there's been false teachers. There's Cain, there's Korah, there's Balaam. These men who didn't care, who didn't love, who weren't saved, saying beforehand they were marked out for this condemnation. They've been spoken of before. You've heard this warning before. And then he describes them again. He says, ungodly persons... Now, we'll see later on in the letter as well that Jude never really defines the false doctrine. That's fascinating. Instead, he's more eager to talk about the character of false teachers. And that's because there is a relation between bad theology and bad living. If you don't have right doctrine, you can't hardly live right. And he says, you watch out. These persons who creep in, they are ungodly people. Their character is not upright. They do not have a renewed heart. And he says, they turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. What does that mean? God's grace? The free get grace? Grace is when God gives us something that we don't deserve. God's grace is when we have the Holy Spirit. God's grace is when we get the atonement of Jesus Christ. God's grace is when we get assistance from above. So how can these terrible, evil people turn God's grace into licentiousness? Can God change? Can they neutralize grace? How do we understand this? How do you turn God's grace into licentiousness? Well, I think there's helpful to realize that they're not changing anything from what God has given. Rather, they take that banner of grace and as unsaved people live a godly life under that banner. And so they bring a bad reputation upon what God has done. 
Let's look at some passages that might would shed light on that. Romans 13, 13. I'll read this to you. Romans chapter 13, verse 13 says this. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. And that word sensuality is the same word for licentiousness in our passage. So this word licentiousness connects us to this concept of sexual sin, sexual perversion, and deviation. When we go to Galatians 5 and learn about the manifestation of the flesh, 5.19 says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, or licentiousness. So Jude here is saying, look, they're ungodly men who take the banner of grace. They take the banner of being believers, but inwardly they're immoral. They're sexually perverted and sinful, says they're ungodly. One last reference to this idea of licentiousness and sexual sin. Uh, it says in uh, 1 Peter we get there, 1 Peter 2.16. It says, Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of God. Yes, so these men take this idea of God's grace and they use it for evil. God's forgiving. We serve a loving God. And then they go engage in sin. It's interesting to realize that in uh, Romans, Paul is eager to combat this kind of thinking. If you remember, he's been arguing about God's grace and God's forgiveness, and he says in verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? He says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? In other words, look, when you're in Christ, you don't want to sin. You can't do this it conflicts your heart. These men continue in sin because they're not in Christ. They're willing to be filled with sensuality and immorality because they're not believers. So they turn the grace of God into licentiousness. And then one last phrase in verse 4. It says deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. When these type of men sneak in, unsaved men, men who are ungodly, men who have an appearance of godliness, but inwardly they're not even saved, they deny Christ. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ just like Judas did. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. So this whole idea that they have uh, a profession, but their works don't match. And in 2 Peter 2.1, it says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And 1 John 2.22 says this, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Yes, so Jude here exhorts the believers. He says, you need to hear this. There are spiritual terrorists afoot who want to destroy the sweetness of your fellowship with God and turn God's grace into licentiousness. That is, come in with a banner, call grace one thing, but really underneath is an immoral life, and they deny our master 
I think this passage will prove helpful for us. Let's move on. I want to spend some time in application as we think, okay, what does this mean for us? And the first application I want to bring out is we need to realize the urgency of defending the gospel. We need to realize the urgency of defending the gospel. He says, earnestly contend for the faith. Not sloppy, not apathetic. And if it was earnest in Jude's time, how much more is it earnestly for us? We need to defend the gospel. We must be careful. We must be eager to defend the gospel. There needs to be a zeal about it. There needs to be a sparkle in your eye, a fire in your soul that's ready to say, no, this is the truth. And also I would point out that he says, earnestly contend for the faith. People sometimes get derailed and they're ready to earnestly defend what color they want the church carpet to be. That's not what you get earnestly contentious about. We don't get earnestly contentious about petty things. We need to be clear and eager and ready to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The truth of who Jesus Christ is, the truth of the inspiration of Scripture, the truth of who God is, that's what we must be earnest to contend for. You know, and this is where some people can get so narrow, even in religious things, and they can become earnestly contentious over a translation of the Bible or a particular nuance on a second or third level doctrine to the point that they don't even contend for the faith. They're so busy contending for other minority issues. True enough, those issues matter, but we're called to contend the faith. And at Southside, may we have the maturity, the loyalty to the main things that we are about defending that and not pointing guns at fellow soldiers for other things. Also, I want to remind you that false teaching is deceptive. The believers in Jude's day needed this letter. They needed it. Jude said, I wanted to tell you about salvation, but really you needed this. And it's true today. People think somehow that you can just ponder five minutes a week and be totally immune to false teaching. It's not true. We need such exhortations. And here and always, God's people need to be reminded they should hold the truth. Eve in the garden was charmed by the voice of the sa Satan through the serpent. Did God really say? What did God say? Does it matter what God says? And as believers, we need to have a similar attitude today. Another application for you. You need to know your Bible. You cannot defend what you do not know. How do you earnestly defend something you cannot explain? How do you hold to the deity of Christ without understanding it? How do you, do you plant both feet beside the New Testament teaching of the gospel if you can't articulate it yourself? Know your Bible. Dig into it. Learn from others. Take time to grasp the once for all delivered to the saints' faith. Also, I encourage you in our church family here, pray for your church. This gives you more and more insights on how to pray for your church and its leaders. Because to be totally transparent, this is one of the main tasks of the elders is to protect sound doctrine. I even turn back to the pastoral epistles and uh, Paul is very clear about this. He says in 
Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So the elders that Titus was to appoint in every city must be able to understand the word and be able to exhort in sound doctrine and contradict, shut down those who say otherwise. Why? It says, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Helps you know how to pray for your elders. Helps you to know how to think about the responsibility that's laid on myself and the other elders. And the reality is, if any one of us in our elder team begins to slide off into a region that's unorthodox, it is the task of the other elders to get an open Bible and go in his face with it and hold him to the truth. And if they fail to do it, it is your task to go to the remaining elders and plead with them to do their job. And if men don't hold to the truth, they're unqualified to lead God's people. This is how you pray. This is how you support. This is how you think about what it means to earnestly contend for the faith. This is why it matters what kind of literature is in the foyer. Because we're to earnestly contend for the faith. This is why it matters what kind of songs we sing on Sunday morning. Because the songs reflect what we believe. And a song can have an awesome tune, but if it's not true, we're not earnestly contending for the faith. No matter what's taught from a Sunday school class to the youth group to the pulpit, Southside is called by God through the inspiration of the scripture to earnestly contend for this body of truth, for the integrity of the gospel, for the integrity of God's word. And that's not always easy. It's not always easy. As a shepherd, I like the idea of feeding sheep and going to green pastures. But sometimes shepherds fight wolves. Sometimes shepherds scrap with mountain lions. You pray that the leaders of your church will have good theological sniffers. And when the wind of false doctrine blows by, we're able to say, no, here's the truth. Let's say it in love. I've been speaking a little bit about earnestly contending for the faith as a church. But I point out, as I said earlier, Jude is written to individuals. He said nothing about churches. Now, the principles I just told you about defending the faith as a church is very biblical and it's sound and it connects totally with this passage. But you individually are called by God to be able to defend the truth. So even if your elders fail, you have the responsibility to know this. You're not off the hook just because you're not a leader. He said, it's needful for these called ones. It's needful for those beloved of God to defend the faith. Last application I have for us is follow the example of Jude and be humble. I remind you that to me the message of Jude is sweetened when I realized this came from a humble man. This came from a man not willing to put himself first. And if we're going to contend for the faith, we need the humility that Jude gives us an example of. If you have a proud man defending for the faith, you might end up with a fist fight. We don't want that. Truth matters, but your attitude matters. The gospel is an objective message, but you can deliver it with an offensive attitude. We don't want to be known 
is the family who, family of God here at Southside, who just grinds people up. Or is known as the vicious people who are just always ready to fight and bicker over theological nuances. Nor do we want to be known as this soft, squishy place who has no convictions and is falling down on the job of defending the faith, of earnestly contending for what's true and right. Remember all those churches at the first part of Revelation? Some had lost their love, some had lost their doctrine. We don't want to lose either. This takes prayer, it takes humility, it takes walking with the Lord, it takes communication. We want to let this passage exhort us in this way. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I thank you for Jude and what it teaches us. I thank you for the needful instruction it gives us this morning to earnestly contend for the faith. This beautiful body of truth, this gospel that was, came from your son and to the apostles and was handed down, And here we are thousands of years later, and the same gospel is still transforming lives, changing hearts, renewing minds, making us new creatures in Christ. We thank you for that. And Father, we live in a culture and a place who hates truth, and they want to relativize everything, and they want to wash out and make sin no longer an issue. But Father, we're here to stand for what you stand for. We're here to say that Jesus is the Son of God, the Eternal One, who can redeem. We're here to say men are sinners and their hearts are dark and we need the Savior. And so I pray that you would help us to earnestly contend for the faith, to have the gentleness and the love that the New Testament speaks of as well. Father, thank you for our church family. Strengthen us and renew our minds from these things. In Jesus' name we ask.